What's going on guys, welcome to another video. In today's video, we're talking with Teddy, who was actually one of the founders of Kanga Cooler, which was on Shark Tank back in 2019. And so Teddy's actually one of our clients. He's gone on from there to actually start his own marketing agency where he works with businesses to help them with their social content. So in today's video, we're talking about retainers, we're talking about packages, we're talking about ads, and we're talking about the differences in advertising for product-based businesses to actually video businesses and how you can take pieces from each one of those things. So without further ado, enjoy the podcast. He said for that, though, like the internet will tell you what people are looking for, but uh, it won't always tell you it. Machines are really good at predicting like patterns, but they can't predict like instincts or like real time thinking. Yeah. And like you're going on Google and you're trying to find a solution to something, the way that you might describe it is very different than, you know, what it is. It's, uh, yeah. but that's why if you have, if you have a mixed, like, I guess if you're doing a mix between branded and non-branded keywords, that's that's a, that's gonna help out a ton. We see that all the time with product though. Like you, Facebook is very like top of funnel lead gen. That's where I've seen like content that either has to do with the product or like really clearly communicating how it's gonna provide value, either make you money, save you time, or build you a community or a like fun experience. Yeah. That'll perform the best. And then we see that people will drop off, then go on to Google, look us up, because they're typically looking for reviews, also videos, does anyone have an unboxing video, whatnot. That's why like the more product you can see out the influencers, like right at the beginning, the better. And then Google is typically the one that's accounting for the actual conversion because yeah. they've, they've Googled, gone on our website, and same interaction, but if we can capture their email, maybe it's Klaviyo, um, but you know, it, it doesn't really matter, but that's why Facebook typically will have a lower ROAS than Google. Oh, yeah. The blended across the board is is much good. higher. Yeah, I mean, to, to go off that point too, it's like with, you just have to think about the platform. So like when people are on Facebook and Instagram, they are, it's more of an interruption-based marketing where like you have to, like they're not really looking for a solution necessarily. They're just scrolling on the platform. And then you have to be in there and be like, hey, let me interrupt what you're doing, build some interest, and then get them to actually convert. So like the, I almost feel like Facebook and Instagram ads are harder because of that. But mm -hmm. then when they come in with like Google, YouTube, uh, and then Google search with that, it's super, it's a little bit easier because like you can just use like keywords, like, uh, you know, if you have a product, it's like how to, how to get better skin if you're selling like a skincare product. Right. And yeah. so if you have that in there, then you're able to just like target people who are the highest intent. They're already looking for a solution. And then it's easier to, you know, it's higher ROAS because you have people who are looking for that solution and they're not necessarily, um, you know, as top of funnel as Facebook. That's, being. that's the power behind a blog too, especially oh, yeah. with products, stuff like that. What, so what sort of tactics have you seen work most effectively when stopping a scroll, capturing attention, yeah. um, interrupting a feed, I guess. I like how you phrased that. For sure. So like the biggest things that I would look at is like, you you can do one of two ways. You can either call out a pain point of the audience, call out who they are, or you can go more like pattern interrupt. The problem with pattern interrupt that I see a lot of people doing is that they're they're trying to do something dumb in the ad that's completely unrelated to the rest of the ad. So like you'll see a hook of like, we've all seen that, um, what's the meme video of like the person hitting the ball, the baseball goes directly into the camera and then you cut to something else. It's like, that stuff's great, but it doesn't actually, like it's not related to your audience's problem half the time. And so like, yeah, maybe you'll catch somebody's attention for the first three seconds, but you won't really hold that attention and the quality of the click and the quality of the lead is not gonna be as good. And so if you can call out a market, if you're like, you know, market, if you're suffering from these problems, listen up, something like that, or you can call out some sort of um, solution or dream outcome for them. That usually helps a lot as well. And it gets them to hook and then the rest of your ad just has to be congruent. And then the other side of that is like, you have a really good ad, but if your landing page, your opt-in page, your VSL page, your VSL, like if you're running that type of funnel, if all of that stuff isn't congruent, then you're gonna have fall off at each step to wherever it isn't congruent. So like if the messaging isn't the same, you just run into a lot of issues there. The How did you determine the messaging that your clientele was looking for most? Was it at, was it paying, paying for leads and then trying to optimize for conversion or 
did, do you feel like you were the market? So you had a clear understanding of what people were actively seeking or missing for master filmmaker. It was definitely like I was the market. So I kind of knew, but if you don't know what your market's issues are, like what I tell all of our clients is like, go, go do like a free case study video, like do a video for somebody and then get a case study, get a testimonial and ask them what they like, what their problems are. So like, if you're running ads to a market, you need to know like what keeps them up at night. What's their dream outcome? Like, where is the pain? What can I press on a lot throughout the ad? And you need to know all those things. Cause if you don't, it's just not going to hit as well. And like the better ads usually hit better because you understand exactly what that person's suffering from and exactly where they want to go. And if you don't know that it's, it's tough to make high performing ads, you know? Yeah. I mean, you can't make high performing ads. You can't um, make high performing ads. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise you're paying a lot of money to educate and that's super hard. You know, I've, I've scaled a couple companies where we've brought new solutions to the marketplace that nobody thought of before. Yep. And once you've reached that threshold to where enough people have heard about you, have seen the solution and can go and attest or explain it to other people, things will start to take off. You'll start to see a higher return, but it's really expensive on the front end because you're paying a ton of money to educate people on what the problem is because they haven't identified it clearly yet. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the last thing you want doing is if you don't have to be doing that, burning your pockets, trying to educate people on your solution or yeah. on the problem that they're having. It's just, if you can find something that's actually relatable on the front end, you're going to see higher click through. What's, yeah. uh, so have you test done any testing with landing pages at all? With um, yeah. So like anything you're going to run from meta or like YouTube ads or anything where you're doing more direct response marketing, the best thing we found for uh, service-based businesses, this is going to be different for product-based businesses, obviously, but for service-based businesses is going to be more of like just a, a simple opt-in. So like the more simple you can have the landing page, the better. And so typically headline, subheadline, and then name, email, phone number, and then a button to submit. Like that's what we found works the best for service, for product, for e-com. I'm not an expert in that. That would be more like your territory with, with product. But like with service, that's typically what's going to work the best. And then you just want to figure out what is the offer of that opt-in page? Like what, what problem are we solving or what, what problem are we promising to solve on that page? And then just putting that in your headline, making sure your sub headline calls out maybe anything else that they've tried in the past that doesn't work and then name a phone number for them to then go to that next page to watch like a, a short video and then book a call. If that's Cause your, so. your end goal is you want to get on the phone with them. Yes. 100%. Yeah. So like the quicker, like for us, everything we do is around getting name, email, phone number so we can put them in an email sequence to follow up. Our setters, our um, appointment setters can call them seven days in a row and get them on an appointment, or they can self book an appointment themselves through email or through the next landing page from there. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah. On, on the product side, you're really hoping to obtain as much information as you can. And you're doing typically like I found what works best is taking creative. So if you're marketing like a, a lifestyle brand or a product that fits into a certain lifestyle, let's call it a beach product, right? If you're showcasing the pain point on the beach and then taking them to a specific landing page that clearly highlights the problem that you're solving on the beach and then trying to either capture email by incentivizing free shipping, a percentage off the front or, you know, a bundle deal sort of thing. But if you can capture their information at the very least, you can retarget them with an email campaign to try to create the value and, and see if you can then convert or at the very least, if you have, if you can get them to follow your account or get their email, you can create a lookalike audience. And so much of that has to do with creating lookalike audiences, because if you're selling a lifestyle product tech, typically it's geographical. Um, people typically live a certain way based off of where they live. Yep. So if you can start to target around that, your likelihood of actually generating convertible audiences is way higher. But, well, and like you said, it's it's congruency again, where it's like if the ad talks about the beach, then the landing page has to be talking about the beach. And where I think a lot of people go wrong is their their um, their ad says one thing, but 
but then their landing page says something different and there's an incongruency between those two to where people are confused and they're like, what the heck is this? Like I clicked on this, it's not what I'm landing on on the landing page, you know? Yeah, what so have you seen that really increases like the conversion rates on product pages? What, how, what have I seen? Yeah, as far as like on, cause obviously you did Kanga and you guys, like did you guys run paid ads for Kanga? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. We, um, and, and honestly like that, we weren't optimizing landing pages much like in the early days, we were just sending people. The huge difference was we realized like at the very beginning, we were sending people to our homepage. Why not send okay. them directly to the product page? Yep. You know, if they're seeing an ad for the product, send them straight to the product page. Now, uh, now with companies that we work with, we all do, we do very like, like my, my firm, we do very specific product based landing pages, like problem solution. And we'll AB test the landing pages to see which solution has the highest click through rate, add to cart, you name it. And from there, we know what sort of email flows we need to be, make based off of that. And so you're really trying to figure out like in the very early stages, you're just trying to figure out where people see the product, where they see the value, how they might use it, and then go from there. Because if the product's good, all you need yeah. to do is get it in their hands once. Because once it's in their hands, once it's top of mind for gifts, gift. And then if you really are good in the like utility of the product is great where you'll make just like a landslide is if you're a consumable product. Yeah. Um, and that's where you try to, that's where you try to, and consumable products are completely different because you're trying to optimize. A lot of times we'll spend, this is actually probably the closest way to compare a product to a, to a service is through a, Con, uh, a a consumable because mm -hmm. you're trying you'll spend a little bit more over the average order value for the customer acquisition cost. Yeah. With if if your site is capable or products is capable of let's say converting two percent of buyers into subscribers, mm -hmm. and your subscription is let's say people churn rate six months. Now you're looking at the average order value across six months for the cost of the initial acquisition. You're just trying to get the first customer in so then you can get them. Yeah, they love it. They do the subscription and then they keep yeah. paying forever. Make it a one to six ROAS. So it's really a calculation of lifetime value where a like product like Kanga is more of a calculation of like distribution. How much product can we get out there? How many retailers can we open up? You know, you use e -com to spearhead and cash flow the business, and then you eventually go to wholesale and try to see how many products you can get out in the wild. And, you know, you keep scaling until you reach a point where people walk into Dick's and stop buying the product. Yeah. And you either try to, you know, alter colorways or come up with new solutions. But that's, that's where that goes. But that's where, like, you know, su subscription-based products are the way to go if you can come up, up with a solution there. 100%. Yeah. I mean, one of our clients has a, his family has a um, coffee brand uh, and they just started doing like coffee, coffee subscriptions that basically just people pay, it gets delivered every month. So then they get more recurring revenue. But um, yeah, I mean, when do, when do you feel like people really started doing the, the subscriptions for products? Like, I feel like it's fairly recent, right? It feels fairly new. Um, yeah. What I think we're going to see a rise in is a product is your gateway to a subscription type of like a, to an accessorized subscription. So let's say, let's use like, you know, whoop, like the, you, you guys familiar with whoop? Yeah. And yeah. yeah. What's up, Jimmy? No, it's like the health tracking band. Yeah. I think it tracks something like that. Yeah. So to, by the actual band, I think it's like a pretty low cost. Mm -hmm. The subscription is 30 bucks a month. It's probably increased, but it's your kind of gateway. So you can buy the band and they probably give you like a four month free trial to where then they know that maybe three months they have enough information to start providing you with biohacking based off of your either sleep schedule or insights that you could actually start applying to your life, they probably have tested is threshold four months, five months, you name it to where people start actually seeing 
a noticeable difference in their lifestyle patterns. Yeah. From there, they know that they can then start charging. Um, so it's kind of like the product itself was almost a gateway. It was its own lead magnet. Like Peloton does that too. And Tesla yep. did that. Tesla, dude, Tesla got sneaky. And I, Jimmy had a question about the Google ad stuff. I'll jump back to that in just a sec. But like Tesla had a sneaky thing. It got Ethan on it. Cause Ethan bought a Tesla recently too, but it's like yeah. you basically, they, they have the subscription for the full self-driving, which like we don't have, but, um, it, they gave everybody 30 days free trial, right? And then, cause this was cause Tesla's sales were down. And then they basically, after the 30 days, they cut the price from $200 a month to 97 bucks a month. And like everybody bought the subscription and like mm-hmm. Ethan bought it. Tons of people bought it. I don't know how much money they made off of it, but it was super smart cause they did that. And then they just increased the recurring revenue where instead of someone buying a car once or like once every couple of years, now they have everybody paying 97 bucks a month on recurring for literally software that costs them next to nothing. There's no overhead. You're just There's paying. Literally no overhead. I yeah, think if you can figure out a way to do that in your business, whether you're, you know, video business, you know, your product based business, whatever it may be, if you can figure out that recurring, um, you're going to make a lot of money because it's that's where you're going to have more revenue retention, and that's what well, makes I, it sell. Yeah. I, that was super well said, Eric. And I think a good way to put it is like, how do you future proof your business? Yeah. Is- Yep. Find a way to make recurring revenue off of a Even if you just have like an, a, a large upfront fee and then you have a smaller, you know, recurring fee on the back end, then you can have more retention to where you get, you know, you make your profit on the front end for customer acquisition and then you have something that's recurring over and over and over and over again after that. Right. Um, and what's tough is that a lot of like agencies, especially their business model is based off churn rate. So you're, you're like, well, every four months we need to onboard a hundred new clients because we're going to lose, you know, 75 and that's still going to keep us on track for our growth goals. Yeah. hundred so, Yeah. And you just don't want that sort of model. That's like that you, obviously it's sustainable. It's how, it's how most have, I would, I would go as far as say most businesses are agencies are built off of that. And then, uh, yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it's it's figuring that out, and then as a video business owner, it's like figuring out how you can make things sticky, uh, because a lot of a lot of guys will just sell a video one time, but then they won't have something where they can deliver it to the client every month to where they're going to continue to pay. Whether that's creative strategy, whether it's monthly ads, whether it's organic content every single month, whether it's YouTube content, it doesn't really matter what it is. Just figuring out like what can I give the client every single month that they're going to keep paying for? So then I don't have to, you know, worry about finding a new client every single time I want to get paid and starting every month over again. You know, that's spot on. Essentially it's like, how can you give the client a taste? So then it becomes a craving. Yep. Absolutely. That's, that's gold. 